going to be a fun live stream. It's Friday night. We can sit back. We can relax. It's probably going to be a long one. I'm not going to waste your time, hopefully, but we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. We're going to talk about RED cameras and the history of RED, the brand, the cinema cameras, the cinema, digital cinema standard, RED. We're going to talk about the history of RED. We're going to talk about the Canon R5. Yes, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. I'm kind of working on a review that I'm putting together. And in the process of going through all that, I thought I'd share a few updates that may or may not be interesting. Eventually, it'll all be consolidated into a final review, so you could watch that or just wait for it, but we can at least talk about it. And we're going to be talking about a hypothetical GH6 and what that could or maybe what it should look like now that we are kind of past the S5. Looking forward, Micro Four Thirds, is it dead? Is there going to be a GH6? What's that going to look like? We're going to talk about it. We're going to go through all that stuff. It may be, it may be a lot, but I'm looking forward to it because I like talking about cameras and I like doing these live streams. I think they're a lot of fun. First, we're probably going to talk about the Canon R5. So maybe we should just start there. The Canon R5 is really interesting. I'm in love with it and I hate it at the same time. And ultimately, my feelings are it's just kind of disappointing because it could have been so great. It could have been the perfect camera, but there's a lot that's holding it back. And I am putting together a proper review, kind of putting all of my thoughts together into one formalized, consolidated video. But in the meantime, as I'm going through the testing process and I have this rental unit, each day I'm finding new and interesting things that kind of... I don't know. The more I use it, the less I want to use it because the the stuff that I find just isn't isn't for me. And I know that there's a lot of people out there who love the R5. Maybe you've bought an R5 and this is by no means saying that you're wrong or that it's a terrible camera and it's a bad decision. No, it's fine. You can use the R5 if it suits your needs. I think what's really important to remember is that we all are different. We're different creators. We have different types of projects. I can only speak from my personal perspective. There's no way I could address every single concern, pro and con for every single individual out there. All I can do is share my opinion as everyone else on the internet who shares their opinion. And you can kind of pick and choose and see what makes the most sense for you and what what's important to you in regards to the R5, but I, I do want to preface all of this with just that statement because I think it's really easy to look at people's criticisms and think that, oh, you're just a Canon hater, you know, or look at people who love the Canon R5 and say, oh, you're just a Canon fanboy. I think there's people that this camera makes a lot of sense for, and I think there's other people where it doesn't make any sense at all. And it's really important to know not just the spec sheet, because I think in the reviews, most of the time, they talk about the specs. What can this camera do? And that's all in the marketing materials. Honestly, if you go to B&H, you go to Amazon, you go to Adorama, any website of your choice, you can see what the camera can do. Now, the one thing that has taken everyone's attention is the overheating issue. And mine as well. When I didn't have the camera, it's all anyone was talking about. I was talking about it as well. But now that I actually have the camera, I wanted to talk about that overheating issue a little bit more. And I, I, I kind of don't even want to talk about it as overheating. I just want to kind of call it like thermal lockdown or like a thermal lockout because it's, it's really hard to know what's going on. There's people who they're filming with the R5 and it's hot outside, but because there's a slight breeze, the breeze is kind of giving a little wind to the camera and it's cooling it down. Or now with the firmware 1.1, people are putting fans next to the camera and, and keeping it cool that way. And they can continuously record and it's no problem. I myself, having shot with the R5, it just in standby mode, it will overheat. So it's really hard to know, is this overheating thing an issue? Is there Are there good workarounds? Like people have talked about putting it into, you know, APS-C mode or oh, close the LCD screen and all this stuff. But I think it's all kind of a big red herring. If you get an R5 and you know about the overheating, there are some workarounds, let's say. There's some things that you can do to kind of fix the issues that Canon didn't seem worthy of designing right into the camera. And we've talked about all that. But aside from the overheating issues, there's some stuff about the camera that I can't necessarily fix. One of them being 
the IBIS, the in-body image stabilization on the R5. In video mode, it doesn't really work for me. I, I'm struggling to see why everyone gives so much praise to the IBIS. I know people will say, some people will say that the Lumix cameras have the best IBIS. And from my experience, that seems to be true. I was really expecting more. You know, on the R5, you have two different kind of IBIS modes. There's the regular mode and then there's an enhanced mode. And each one of them comes with a crop. And when I do my formal review and put this all together, I'll have some examples and kind of show all this in practice. But I was shooting with the camera, handheld, kind of run and gun style, but you know, nothing crazy, you know, it's more or less that kind of, you want that handheld look, but you don't want it to be too shaky. And I was filming with the R5 exactly how I film with my GH5. And usually that footage, silky smooth. It's great. It's fantastic. And this isn't slow-mo. It's, you know, regular speed. With the R5, I came back and I was like, wow, this is like a lot more jittery than I expected. Like, and I, I'm a relatively stable shooter. You know, I know some people have different levels of, you know, how much, how good of a doctor could they have been in another life? And in general, my hands are pretty steady. I'm not doing anything crazy. And I was looking at the footage just going like, this just like looks kind of weird. I've also been shooting with the R5, some of the 4K 120 frame slow-mo stuff, kind of using to, to, to track, you know, the autofocus and see how that performs and how well it does in that slow motion mode. So you can really see, okay, how well is it actually tracking the eyes? Doing stuff like pulling the camera back, pushing the camera in, having usually my kids running around and seeing if I can track them in kind of this unpredictable way that would be very difficult to do if I was doing manual focus. So relying on the autofocus to do its job and then filming that at 4K 120 to see how it holds up. And one thing I noticed was that while the autofocus does work well, it's not perfect. And I also noticed that the IBIS, cause again, I'm shooting this handheld, seemed to be adding like extra jerks and movements into the 4K 120 footage, which I've had this experience before on the Ursa Mini Pro using a Canon stabilized lens turning the stabilization on in the lens seems to every once in a while, like it'll shift, you know, those optical elements to stabilize, but it does it in such a way that would be fine for photography, let's say, but for video, it almost adds unnecessary movement and makes the image look worse because in video you see the full shift rather than in photography where it might just, you know, move really quick and then kind of stabilize and correct on the fly as you're taking a burst shot real quick. So, there's some weird stuff and I can't understand the full technical side of it. Maybe there is something I'm doing wrong. Like that's always a caveat, right? I'm just someone using the camera, doing my best, navigating the menus, trying to dive in deep to understand what's going on. But as far as anyone's been talking about this camera, it's always about the overheating, the overheating, the overheating. But as I've talked about before, I'm struggling with just basic, you know, info display type stuff on the screen. When I hit record and all of my video settings just disappear and you don't know most of the information that you'd want to know while you're during recording, like the histogram or your exposure meter or any of the other valuable things like what codec you're filming in or what picture profile you're using. All that stuff just disappears the moment you hit record. And this wouldn't be a problem if you could hit info and like turn it back on and then hit info again and have a clean feed. That's very common on the Lumix cameras. You have different display modes. But on the R5, there doesn't seem to be any way to kind of keep all of the information that's there before recording, during recording. Pairing that with the kind of wonky IBIS that isn't as stable as I would like, and the times where I'm kind of looking at it in that slow motion environment and saying, wow, this, this almost is making it less stable <laughs> because it's adding its own movement you know, to compensate for mine, but it's not in this kind of smooth, pleasing way. And then the autofocus, evaluating it in that environment, seeing how well it's tracking the eye. It works and it works well, definitely better than the Lumix cameras, but I still look at it and I kind of wonder, is this something I would actually rely on 100%? I think I'm more at that kind of 90 to 85%. On my initial test shooting, it feels like it's at 95% or 100%. It always sees an eye, it's always tracking it. But then reviewing the footage after the fact and you see the slow motion, you go, oh, it isn't quite as perfect as maybe it should be. Also, I'm looking at some of the footage in 4K and looking and going, you really think 4K would be more detailed? And I have to do some of those side-by-sides, but if you just wanna do this yourself with, for, with any camera that can take a photo, you can take a picture, 
see the full resolution of the image, scale it down into 4K and see what 4K should look like, and then shoot video and compare it side by side and see which one holds more detail. Because a lot of things that are recorded as 4K, you can record one giant pixel as a 4K pixel, and it's just one pixel of detail. So 4K can hold, there's a, a, a finite limit to how much detail can be held within 4K, but there's also a bunch of room under that where detail can just be lost and smeared and blurred and it's still recorded as 4k high quality 4k and i'm looking at the footage going this just looks kind of like a little soft to my eye it seems like i should be having more detail compared to the photos you're able to get out of the r5 which are breathtaking and, and amazing like i said if you're a photographer and the r5 is the perfect camera for you because it shoots 45 megapixel stills with incredibly good autofocus at 20 frames per second because you need that, then yeah, get the R5. But if you're thinking about the R5 through this lens of, okay, this is gonna be great, it's gonna be awesome, I just have to figure out the overheating situation. Me personally, the overheating is almost the least of my worries because I am kind of doing some workarounds. If you are filming with the R5, I would definitely recommend the main thing to do in the menus. Normally on cameras, I like to leave cameras on all the time because I think it's kind of annoying whenever you pick up a camera, maybe you set it down or maybe it's on your neck or you just kind of down by your side for a couple of minutes or something and you, and you pull it back up. And if it's gone to sleep, I hate just that like half second to second delay of waking the camera back up, all the settings coming back and it just kind of, you know, restarting itself, waking itself up. I think that's really annoying and really irritating, especially on the fly, because the moment you're ready to shoot, I just want to be ready to shoot. So most of the time I leave cameras kind of on, unless it's going to be a prolonged period where I'm going to obviously turn it off because I don't want to be wasting battery. But in general, that extra waste here and there in between, in between takes, I'm kind of fine with just so that the camera is ready to go. Don't shoot the R5 like that. The R5, my R5 anyway, at least this one, will overheat in standby mode. Even with overheat protection on, it'll get to the point where it's just, oh, you can't record 4K HQ anymore. So I would definitely recommend if you're shooting with the R5, go into the power settings and just turn all that stuff way down. Like have the screen turn off after, you know, 10 seconds, have the camera shut down after 30 seconds, like everything be the most conservative with your power usage as possible. That way the camera, if you forget to turn it off, you know, to save the kind of thermal management, the camera will do it for you. And it is really annoying because the moment you're ready to go again, the camera is like shutting itself down. You're like, no, 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 wake up. I'm ready to shoot. So it's a little goofy, a little tricky, but I would recommend that. Make sure those power settings are like the most conservative, like the super fast shutdown, go to sleep right away. And that'll hopefully kind of get you through those gaps so the camera can keep cooling itself down so that it's not overheating, as they say. That is one thing I would definitely recommend if you're shooting with the R5. But so like I said, the overheating hasn't really been a problem. It's been all the other stuff that's kind of annoying and irritating. As far as you know, changing the white balance, I've talked about this before, but you can't change the white balance while you're recording. And I was filming something where we were outside and it was a scene and then we walked inside. Of course, the color temperature is different from outdoors to indoors. And thankfully I have the variable ND adapter. So I was able to adjust my ND on the fly but there's no way to adjust your white balance during recording. And I find this really, really irritating. Some cameras in the past, you couldn't do this, but at least, you know, within the past three or four years, you know, with at least the cameras I'm using as far as the GH5 goes and the Ursa Mini Pro, I'm pretty sure you can change it on the fly in the Ursa Mini Pro. Um, you can change the white balance on the fly. You can definitely do it on the GH5. And with the R5, you can't while you're recording, you would have to stop recording, change your white balance, and then start again. And one of the cool things about the R5 that I do like is that if you use the RF lenses, they have that control ring on there. So the 24 to 70 lens has a control ring that you can program to be your white balance. And that's a nice way to just, you know, make those kinds of adjustments on the fly, or you can kind of program a lot of stuff to it. But if you wanted, you could program it to white balance. And if you're in not record mode, you're in standby mode, you can change your white balance with the ring. It's great. The moment you hit record, can't change your white balance anymore. And while this isn't like one of those huge deal breaker things, like the camera's broken, like, no, the camera's not broken, but it's just really irritating. It's those little 
inconveniences, those things that just add up over time. And hopefully you can understand that as I'm going through this stuff, it's not like any one of these makes the camera awful. That's why I don't, you know, there's a lot I love about the camera, but there's a lot that I just find incredibly irritating and it all adds up to being this really underwhelming, irritating experience. Not only do you have to find workarounds for the overheating, but I'm finding you have to find workarounds for all the other things as well. The stuff that you would just want there as a hybrid shooter, switching between photo and video mode, and then in video mode, feeling like you don't have the information right you know, at your fingertips. You, don't, you can't do the things that you want to do. It's got IBIS, but it's not working all that well. If you want the enhanced mode, it's going to do a severe crop on the footage. And then you're like, well, why do I have the full frame camera anyway? It just makes for an overall kind of unpleasant experience, an underwhelming experience where a lot of this stuff would be really easy. It's just like I'm always saying with Sony and Canon, not including shutter angle. The Lumix cameras have had shutter angle for so long and it's like it's inherent to shooting video or cinema or film or any kind of production. Having shutter angle is so, so important. And I understand back when it was the 5D Mark II and it was a photography camera that happened to have a video mode that we didn't have shutter angle then. But we're 10 years, well past 10 years from that point and we have these hybrid cameras that include shutter angle and we have other ones that just don't. And this is something that's in the menus. It's a firmware setting. It's just a way to, to calculate your shutter speed, just being able to set your shutter angle. And yeah, I know it's a cinema thing. And if you want a real video camera, buy a real video camera. Like I, I know those arguments. I've heard them a million times. But what I'm talking about is simple stuff. Just leaving the info display on the screen all the time. Have the icons be more clear. The stabilization icon on the R5 is incredibly weird. I don't understand why they did the, the icon. I'll, I'll show you what I mean in my proper review where we can talk about this stuff with a little bit more examples, but there's just a lot that seems like it's not well thought out and, and making the features helpful and accessible, accessible to the people who want them, where it's definitely catering to photographers. It gives them everything they would want right there. And for video, it's almost like, oh no, we don't, we don't do that. that. For whatever reason, that'll just be too complicated. Like, why can't you change your white balance while you're recording? Is that incredibly difficult to do in the software? Or is, is Lumix doing some amazing feat of technology by allowing you to change your white balance during recording? Is Lumix doing something incredible by just showing you how much time is remaining on the card while you're recording? The R5 will show you how long you've been recording, counting up to 30 minutes, because that's the maximum record time. Then you have to start again but it won't show you how much time you have remaining. To find out how much time you have remaining, you have to dig into the menus and see how much time you can record in each of the modes. So is Lumix doing something you know, mind boggling that the people at Canon and Sony can't figure out? They can't figure out shutter angle. They can't figure out just how to display how much time is remaining during video recording. They have it for photos. It shows you how many photos you have left. You can take this many more before you need to change cards. Very helpful information for a photographer. You would think someone shooting video would want the same, especially a hybrid shooter who's switching between these modes. When I'm shooting video, I'm kind of running blind knowing like, well, I hope my card's not full anytime soon. And if it is, then I guess I'll, I'll hopefully have an SD card in it as well, right? It doesn't have two of the same card slots. So you have to kind of balance between which card is going where. And if it fills up, it fills up. And there's no way to really know without diving into those menus. So there's a lot of just like little irritating stuff like that, that I wouldn't say is a deal breaker. If you find value in the R5 and it's meaningful to you and it has features you want, then great, go ahead and get it. But for me, even beyond the overheating, I just, I feel like that was such the focal point of all the reviews. This amazing camera, it's got IBIS, it's got, you know, uh, face tracking and it's incredible 4K 120 and 8K raw and all this stuff, but it overheats. And I go, okay, yeah, it overheats, but it also X, Y, Z, all the stuff we've been talking about. All that adds up far more than, hey, I can shoot, you know, in this kind of, you know, 4K 120 mode, but it looks almost like 1080p to my eye. Like it really does. I was looking at it just going like at 100% and I'm like, this should be a lot sharper. There should be a lot more detail in this image, you know, shooting 4K 120 than there is and just being kind of like underwhelmed. And it's like, oh, well, I can already do 1080, 120 on the GH5. So what am I missing? And 
now that I'm talking about it, that might be a good test. Put the 1080p and 120 of the CH5 versus the 4K120 of the R5 and see how they perform. It might be an interesting test. I can't you know, draw any conclusions just yet. As I said, I'm just kind of reviewing the footage. And by the way, the footage is also incredibly hard to edit. I don't have a brand new amazing iMac or brand new MacBook Pro, but it's only a couple years old. And you'd think that, you know, editing these MP4s wouldn't be that big of a problem, but it is. For, I'm not trying to do the 8K RAW. It's just 4K. You know, can I get decent playback? Nope. Even if I drop my resolution and premiere down to like a half or a quarter or even an eighth, still makes no difference. Locks up the computer. Can't preview anything. I'm in a situation where I have to make proxies. And that's just not something that I want to be part of my workflow anymore. And I know there's a lot of people out there who don't have time to make proxies and they don't have the money to invest in a brand new editing computer just to take advantage of a new camera. So there's a lot of those things that just add up over time. Like I said, I'm gonna to put together a proper review to maybe condense all of it and show some of those examples, but I at least wanted to talk through it to inform some people out there to be like looking for this stuff, like, hey, pay attention. Don't just get so laser focused on the overheating and think that's the only thing wrong with the R5 from a video perspective. Because again, I can only talk from a personal perspective and I like to shoot photo and video and I like them both to be equally functional, at least to a certain degree within a camera. I know it doesn't have built-in ND filters. I'm not asking for that. I'm not asking for XLR plugs or other cinema camera features. I'm just asking for what's there to be well thought out and well designed. And it seems like the video mode is kind of an afterthought in the R5. And ultimately, that's why I'm kind of disappointed with it. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, let's see. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to Friday night. The R3D story is a good one. Uh, Jim Gennard uh, disrupted the market twice, first with Oakley and secondly with Red. Yes, we're going to get to that. I wanted to start with the R5 because that's the the most pressing stuff on my mind, but I put together some stuff talking about the history of Red, which I think is pretty fascinating, at least for the people who don't know. Does your R5 still stay on all the time? Yes, it does, John. The R my R5 stays on all the time. And that's why I started using those power saving modes to keep the camera from overheating, but also just to keep the thing off because I can't actually turn it off. I don't have time to be chasing shutter speed. I set my camera to 180 degrees and leave it. Yes, Trevor, same, likewise. And it's really easy to get tripped up because if you switch you know, on the R5, you switch to 4K 120, it'll default your shutter to one over 125, but that's not what you want. You want it to be, you want it to be one over uh, 240, but I don't even think you can do that. I think you can do 250. You know, so like there's some like you switch between modes and the shutter speed isn't keeping up with what you want it to be. So you're constantly managing, and then especially if you're working with somebody else and you have to communicate this to a crew member or a teammate, and you say, hey, you know, here's how we're shooting, and you're okay, we're gonna switch to 4K 120 real quick, and then being like, oh yeah, make sure you update your shutter speed. It's just like another thing to worry about, another thing to manage, and it can end up making footage just look mismatched and wrong, and it's so much easier to have shutter angle, especially when it should just be built right into the software. I think hopefully the S5 gets it. I think the Lumix S5 doesn't have it right now or won't have it at release, but maybe we'll get it with firmware. I just I just don't understand why they're making hybrids that don't include shutter angle, because it's it is the video kind of default or kind of standard because you're changing frame rate so often, especially in these cameras that have multiple frame rate modes. All these company spoils to just uh, take the Blackmagic menu system and copy it. I know, seriously, Trevor. It's, the Blackmagic cameras have the best menu system, hands down. And their menu system is nothing like everyone else's. Everyone else is going for like this page, these pages. I don't like why why are they obsessed with pages and rows and like cells? It's like a it's like a spreadsheet almost in all these cameras and you're navigating cells and rows and columns. It's like the black magic cameras is just like a, a tile based system, which makes so much more sense on a touch screen and from a UI perspective, it's so much nicer to use. You can just throw black magic twelve click clips on the timeline and begin editing right away. Right. And I assume that's for B Raw and uh, well, it doesn't do 12K ProRes, does it? Um, so yeah, that's like just B-RAW. Like, and B-RAW works great. Again, on my laptop, that's not brand new, but it's not that old either. Can pull it right in, playback 
is fine, even in Premiere, which I know some people say, you know, isn't as optimized as maybe some other, you know, like, oh, if you're on a Mac, use Final Cut. Premiere just works well for, for teams and collaboration because it's just kind of, it's a little bit more universal uh, of, a, of an application than something that's only available on Mac computers. So I do like Premiere for that uh, reason. And then Resolve is nice and is probably, you know, the best uh, color grading suite, but lacks some of the other uh, pieces of the Adobe suite that you get, right? You get Audition, you get Premiere, you get After Effects, you get Photoshop and Illustrator. Like there's a lot that comes with the Adobe suite that's basically everything that you would need to do anything. And so does it make sense having kind of these one-off applications? I think for some people it does, but especially if you're working on a team, I think it just makes sense to, unfortunately, like Adobe's the only one kind of doing that right now. And they kind of have the, the standard in a lot of these, especially for, you know, typical productions, right? They're still avid. There are other systems out there and it's Premiere is by no means the best but it is kind of in some ways the most universal. Uh, so I think that like, it's a shame these codecs and these video files from these hybrids are just such a chore to edit. I wish it were easier, but like, I mean, I've never had issues with the GH5 aside from the 10 bit modes, um, which do chug a little bit, but like the 8-bit modes are fine. And granted, the R5's 10-bit, and so maybe that's just the problem. Like I don't, I don't know what it is with how these codecs are designed and developed, or how they work with these uh, computers exactly. But it seems like I can have ProRes 10-bit files from the Ursa Mini uh, Pro that edit just fine. So it can't just be the 10-bit component. There's something else. It's the if this is the H.265 compression, like I don't know exactly what it is under the hood, but when you look at an MP4, you think, oh, I should just be able to edit it. It's an MP4. Or, hey, it's a .mov. I should just be able to edit it. And then sometimes you just can't. It just chugs and your whole system is screaming, your fan's blowing, your computer's overheating, and you can't even play a single frame smoothly because it's just bottlenecks everything. You're like, how can I record this in a camera and I can't play it back in a computer? Just kind of odd. Trevor says, I take S1 footage right in Resolve for all I, for H.265 right to my iPad Pro. Both are smooth. Yeah, I've heard good things about the iPad uh, for editing. Uh, I don't think it would fit my workflow, but I don't know if I ever get an iPad Pro. Maybe I'll check it out. b -Raw is like butter in Resolve. Yeah, b -Raw is like butter in Premiere, too. Uh, it's probably even better in Resolve, but it does just fine in, in Premiere for me. Yes, Blackmagic Design is the only manufacturer that designs their own camera sensor, Kodak, and nonlinear editor, which gives them a tremendous advantage over the rest. It is true, and I'm very excited for what they have next. I think the 12K Ursa uh, Mini is awesome, but I'm really excited for what they have next for the Pocket Cinema line. If they come out with a camera that's you know two thousand, three thousand dollars, that fixes all the issues from the current Pocket Cinema cameras, the 4K and the 6K. That'll probably be the camera, even aside, even if it doesn't have autofocus. And I don't even want to say that. I don't want to throw that out into the universe because then maybe someone will hear it and go, oh, great, we don't have to have autofocus. And it's like, no, 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 you really should. Um, but even without that kind of new like killer feature that's in the Sony and the Canon cameras, everything else about the Blackmagic is so basically perfect, at least in terms of like the footage and the workflow. It's like if they just refine a couple of those issues with the, the pocket cameras, those will be phenomenal. So I'm really looking forward to those. But we should talk about the history of RED, the story of RED, as of September 2020. Let's take a look here. Let me just check, see if there's anything else that's popped up in the chat. Nope, moving right along. Let's talk about the story of red the history of red as of september 2020 i did a video like this a while ago and there have been a lot of changes since and i gotta say i have not kept up to date with red day in and day out over the last 10 to 15 years no it's something i check in from time to time i don't own a red but i do like to stay in the know on this kind of stuff because i find the company fascinating if you don't know about red this is probably for you. And if you do know about Red, hey, sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. We're going to start at the beginning. The Red Digital Cinema Camera Company was founded in 2005 by Jim Gennard of Oakley. And he did it because he just wanted to make some awesome 
film cameras, digital film cameras that were cheap at the time. Red now, nowadays is known as being very expensive, but at the time, Red was kind of undercutting the digital cinema market by offering cameras that were ridiculously cheap in comparison to their other digital cinema equivalents. Nowadays, it's very expensive compared to hybrids and other of the, like the really cheap, you know, $2,000 or $3,000 cinema cameras. But at the time, that was RED. They were the pioneers in that space. The whole beginnings of RED kind of revolved around this 4K versus 2K, or 2K you could also think of as basically 1080p. And which did you need? Did you need 4K or was 1080p enough? Was 2K really all the eye could see or was 4K valuable? And there was a lot of arguments and discussions and debates at the time about which was better. You know, do you need the resolution? Do you need the dynamic range? Is it the color science? Like what, what is the thing? And Red's thing was 4K RAW. They pioneered that. They said it was the most important thing ever. And as we know now, the industry has kind of caught up to that. But back in 2005, and then in 2007, when the first camera finally came out, this was kind of revolutionary and groundbreaking to just even consider like 4K RAW. Like, why would anyone need that? Do you need it? There's plenty of films that are shot digitally at 1080p. And it's like, no, 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 no. If you want to be digital film, you have to have the resolution and you have to have the flexibility in post-production of RAW to really make the most of it. And so this concept of like digital film, trying to emulate film digitally in terms of the dynamic range, in terms of the resolution, was all central to the RED philosophy. You had initial early adopters like Peter Jackson, Steven Soderbergh, and David Fincher who gravitated to these cameras and used them basically right from the beginning and really got behind the company in a way that put RED on the map rather than just being this cool ca camera company that makes cool products there were professional Hollywood directors who adopted the system and switched from film. We still have a few holdouts who are still shooting film, but nowadays most Hollywood movies are shot digitally, which again, back in 2005 and, and early on, that was not the case. This was very, very different uh, workflow, both in, literally in terms of the workflow, but also from the philosophy of how do you produce a movie. Another thing I should mention here is reduser.net. If you want to live and breathe red cameras, go over to reduser.net. If you want to take a look at what it looks like, if you've never been here before, red user looks basically the way I've always remembered it looking. I don't think they've changed this forum basically forever. But if you want the inside access, direct to red, talk to other people who are red users, this is where you wanna be. And it's actually a really helpful space for just understanding filmmaking, cinematography, and camera technology in general. And it's kind of a unique, cool place. It definitely is a lot of people who love RED cameras. So if you hate RED, probably don't go there. <laughs> but if you wanna know a little bit more about RED and really dive in deep, because what I'm gonna be talking about is very, very high level. If you wanna get into the weeds, go over to RED user, because that's where it's at. So in 2007, Red finally releases the Red One, which is the Mysterium sensor. That was the first sensor in the first camera body, the Red One. And you can see there in the background, the Red One was a tank, or maybe more like a bazooka. This thing was big, it was heavy, and it was kind of a pain to work with. It had overheating issues, it had a lot of bugs and quirks that, you know, it's the first product from this company doing some pretty incredible things. And it wasn't as loved and cherished by as many people as you know, you might think for how popular RED has become over the years, the RED one was a, a mixed bag. People definitely loved it, but other people found it really tiresome and irritating to have to work with, and so they opted for other camera solutions. But it definitely was the first thing giving us this 4K RAW workflow that set the pace for everything moving forward. A lot of the problems with the RED one were immediately taken into development for Red's next products. So in 2010, taking all those lessons from the Red One, they upgrade the Red One with the Mysterium X sensor, so giving a better sensor to Red One users. And this is kind of an interesting thing that Red does. They kind of offer these upgrade programs where you might have a camera, but then you can get it upgraded for significantly cheaper than someone who's buying it brand new. So they really try and do give their customers kind of this like loyalty discount and, you know, taking advantage of older cameras and still making them new and relevant when they do come out with new 
upgrades. And it's not as universal or as often as you might like, but it's kind of that thing if you had like an iPhone 9 and then, which an iPhone 9 doesn't even exist, but if you had an iPhone 10 and then an iPhone 11 comes out and it's like, okay, we'll give your iPhone 10 uh, not only just the user interface and the software, but like we'll actually switch out, you take it to the Apple store and we'll switch out the cameras and we'll give you the better camera or something like that. That's sort of the philosophy of Red that these things can be upgraded as things change over time. But Mysterium X was a bigger phenomenon because of the Epic X. So in 2010, this is when Red coined this term DSMC, Digital Stills and Motion Capture cameras that are meant for both photo and video. Basically what we call hybrids nowadays, but they were talking about it as DSMC back in 2010. And with the Epic X, with the Mysterium X sensor, that was their goal, that was their vision, to be able to have such high resolution cameras that they would make amazing cinema, but you could also pull you know, high resolution raw images for photography from those same cameras. And if you wanted to do a photo shoot for a magazine, you could do it with an Epic. Or if you wanted to shoot a movie, you could also do it with an Epic. In 2011, they debuted the Scarlet X, which was kind of the smaller, not actually smaller, but just the cheaper, um, more affordable, more economy version of the Epic. It couldn't do as much in terms of frame rates, but it was basically like a little mini Epic, not quite as good, but kind of like a downgrade, but for the people who wanted the, the more affordable solution, that was the Scarlet. But it was interesting at the same time, Canon introduced you know, Cinema EOS with the C300 and the C300 and the Scarlet X were announced the same day for basically very similar pricing. I mean, there is some differences with accessories and whatnot, but for basically the same price, on the same day, these things were announced uh, as being kind of available and like the full specs, you know, released. These two cameras went head to head and Canon at the time was kind of laughed at for the C300 being so under spec compared to the Scarlet. But once you count in accessories and workflow, and now that we, we've seen what Cinema EOS has become, we know that the C300 was a very popular camera and did great things at least from my assumption for Canon and Scarlett did good things for red as well. But what seemed to be, you know, equal competition and competitors in the same space, I think ended up kind of diverging more or less the red ecosystem and workflow is very different from, you know, the people who might gravitate towards more of like the Canon C300 or C500 uh, type shooting. So while they do look like they're kind of basically, you know, direct competition, and they are in some ways, I think they end up diverging a little bit more than you might first assume. And it's interesting to see how far these companies have come, you know, today, where Red is very clearly in one space, and then the Cinema EOS stuff is kind of in another. And it's just kind of interesting. I don't think people really relate them as much as maybe they did at the time back in 2011. In 2012, the Epic X got the Dragon 6K sensor upgrade. You'll notice we started with 4K RAW, now we've got 6K RAW with the Dragon sensor in the Epic X. So same form factor, same camera body, but upgraded with this new sensor that is of course better, higher resolution, better dynamic range, etc., etc., etc. In 2013, Scarlet X gets the Dragon sensor upgrade as well. Not as high frame rates, but same kind of philosophy. You have a camera body that you bought and for not as much as it would cost to buy it new, you can upgrade the sensor in it, which is the Mysterium X sensor. You can take that to the Dragon sensor, but the Dragon sensor wouldn't work in a red one, let's say. So you kind of have that, this is where red kind of um, started confirming or conceptualizing this idea that a body's released and then a sensor's released and then a body's released and then a sensor is released. And there'll always be kind of like this one generation overlap where you can kind of take the sensor, put it in the old body, but then the new body will come out and then a new sensor will come out and that sensor will go to that body. It kind of this, I don't know how to describe that, the stair-stepping or water falling, some sort of philosophy where there's an upgrade path and, and, and intentionally releasing bodies and sensors separately is kind of when they started to put this on their roadmap as if like, this is their plan, what they're going to be doing moving forward with DSMC. So in 2015, 
they announced DSMC2. So as we said, the Dragon sensor came out, so now it's time for the new body. So this is DSMC2, and this is a hardware and accessories redesign featuring the established Dragon sensor. So take the Dragon sensor, new body. And this was kind of coined as being weapon. Red has always had this thing where they name their stuff really cool names like Epic and Dragon and Weapon. And they kind of get in trouble sometimes. They had an EVF at one point that said bomb on the side of it. So people were getting pulled over by TSA and airports because they're saying, why do you have something in your case that says bomb on it? Yeah, kind of a, a slight misstep. But they always like to do that kind of cool, edgy stuff. And I think that's what's worked so well for Red over the years is that their marketing, their branding, so much of the Red cameras is just about the style of the company and the, the vibe that it gives you, where a company like Blackmagic or Canon or Sony, they're kind of stiff and corporate, where Red is definitely more of like the underdog, the rebel, and they do it with how they name their products and just the visual like imagery on their site. And they have cameras with skulls on them. Like this is the style of the company. And I think it speaks really strongly to certain people who want that cool factor in their equipment. I can't really think of another, you know, camera company, at least at the time, you know, back then doing this kind of thing, like making the camera itself this cool, visually attractive, fun thing that you just, when you hold it, it makes you feel a certain way because it's cool. It's like a weapon. It's like, it's almost make, giving you an upgrade as a shooter just by having this thing that's really cool, like a, like a really nice car, you know, that's advertised as being sporty and luxurious and amazing and beautiful and sleek and designed. And Red was putting that effort into cameras, which was kind of also a new, interesting concept. Scarlet W uh, would have the Dragon sensor as well. So this is what kind of kicked off DSMC2, is the Scarlet WW, standing for weapon. And then around this time, there was also the Red Raven, which had a 4.5K Dragon sensor. And the Raven uh, kind of came and went pretty quickly. They were um, sold through Apple. Um, it was meant as this kind of even cheaper uh, entry point into the Red ecosystem but I don't think they really sold all that well. You can definitely find them used nowadays, but it's not a product that they've continued or really gets talked about anymore. It came and went pretty quick, as well as some other uh, red. There was gonna be Red Ray at one point, like Blu-ray, but Red Ray, to where you could play you know, 4K R3D RAW files on your TV, and that just never came to anything. I think they were gonna do a laser projector at one point that that never came out. Red is kind of notorious for some things being vaporware and other things actually being real. And so it's really hard to tell like what's coming, what's not. Scarlet at one point, the, the amazing, you know, Scarlet was supposed to be 3K for 3K and it definitely wasn't. It was more like, what was, I, I forget what it came out as, like 4K for 6K or 9K or something like that. It was around that, definitely higher than what was it was initially supposed to be. So they like to change their plans all the time over there at Red based on things not working out. And I think the Red Raven was kind of like that. I'm sure they're great cameras. I'm sure people use them, but just not a, a hot seller uh, over there at, at the Apple store, I don't think, anyway. In 2016, we had the Epic W, which had the new helium sensor. So this is an 8K Super 35 sensor. Better, faster, better dynamic range, all that stuff. Things just keep getting better. Things keep getting expensive, <laughs> more expensive, yeah, but they keep getting better. So now we're up to 8K RAW from a Super 35 sensor. Pretty incredible, um, but also, you know, it costs you a, a pretty penny as well. 2017, we got the new Monstro 8K Vista Vision sensor. So we went from Super 35, now there's a Monstro sensor. It, its claim to fame is that it's over 17 stops of dynamic range. This thing is a beast but it's also incredibly expensive. 2018, they got the new Gemini sensor upgrade and Gemini features dual ISO. So it's a smaller resolution, 5K sensor, but it's really good in low light having that dual ISO. That's become more and more common on a lot of cameras like uh, the Lumix S1H and S5, as well as I believe the Sony a7S III has something similar, but it might not. Um, but this dual ISO, so like you can shoot in the dark. And 
Gemini, if you don't know, is one of the 12 signs of the zodiac, and it's a symbol is a twin, a pair of twins. So kind of making sense with dual ISO, like two different ISOs, twin, twin ISOs. Kind of a nice little, if you ever forget which sensor, which camera body, at least you can remember Gemini is the one that has dual ISO because you know what Gemini means. So here we are in 2020, and I feel like up until this point, red made a huge splash at the beginning, got really big, and then has kind of been trickling down ever since. For whatever reason, that's just at least my impression. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not. But it's been so so much in Hollywood that it's just become, okay, these are filmmaker cameras, and yes, you know, these directors, they're gonna have 50 of them on set because their budgets are ridiculous, but for day-to-day -day people who are, you know, they're gonna spend 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars on a camera and then it's gonna be upgraded in a, in a year or two, and it's like, it's this investment. I think there's definitely some people that it makes sense for, for you know, productions, but as hybrid technology and cameras has become a lot more common, a lot more ubiquitous, you've got Canon and Sony and Panasonic and Blackmagic Design, and you even have oddballs like the Z-Cam or Kinefinity. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of companies in this space making a lot of different products at a lot of different price points. And you definitely have a lot of popularity with the low end market, the kind of consumer market where things are $2,000 or $3,000 or $5,000. But red has always been up there and kind of out of reach and seemingly like very, very high end, very professional. They, in, in fact, at one point said they were intentionally leaning into that of, Red will never be, you know, the kind of consumer camera you can get at Best Buy. It will always be this elite level product. So now in 2020, we get the Komodo 6K Super 35 camera for $6,000. 6K for 6K. Hey, they finally did it. Not 3K for 3K, but it's 6K for 6K. And the Komodo does have a new sensor, and that is body only. There's, of course, accessories that go along with it that are going to make it more expensive. But for $6,000, you, for the first time, have this very low entry point into the RED ecosystem with a camera that has a lot built right in. You would want to rig it out with a few extra bells and whistles, but for the most part, the RED cameras have always been these kind of modular systems where you buy the brain and then you gotta bolt all this other stuff onto it and it just, the, the costs add up really add up really quick. The Komodo is a little bit different. It's meant to be that kind of buy it and it's basically all there and you can do almost everything you would want and it's only $6,000. And there are a lot of people who've bought these that are really loving them. They're still technically kind of in a beta program. Like I said, if you wanna know all the detail, go over to Red User because that's where you can find the actual nitty gritty specifics of when these things were actually available because you can't buy them from the red site right now you can't go buy a komodo right now it's kind of limited access only but it is cool that they're catering to this kind of lower end of the market by still offering a camera that is really high end in terms of uh, features and kind of the, the footage that you're able to capture with it but a camera isn't going to do everything if you're filming something ugly it's going to look ugly doesn't matter how beautiful the camera is the subject of what's being filmed matters as well we also, just to kind of set in place where everything shakes out with the DSMC2 line, because you can buy all these cameras right now and they all have all different flavors and price points and et cetera, but this is where things currently stand. So there's the Dragon X, which is a 6K Super 35 sensor for roughly $15,000. You've got the Gemini 5K, remember that's the dual ISO one, Super 35 sensor, that's $20,000, give or take, plus accessories for all these. These are just base price points, right? Helium 8K now, Super 35 sensor, that's 25,000, so more resolution, but not as good low light. And then the Monstro 8K Vista Vision, big sensor, $54,000 just for the base package. That's the current DSMC uh, line two, that's the current DSMC2 lineup. And to make it even more confusing, there's also the Ranger models. So a little bit, you can see it in the background there, there's a Ranger, a little bit different form factor, different body style, and you can see that the prices are, you know, a Gemini 5K Super 35 Ranger is 25,000 compared to a DSMC2 Gemini 5K is 20,000. So about a $5,000 upgrade for more of the features that come in the Ranger body, but those are less kind of modular and more like single unit than the DSMC2 cameras. But same sensors, and that's kind of where it all shakes out at this point. Uh, of course, you have things like the red hydrogen, the red 
phone, the smartphone Red made that was supposed to be, you know, the cinema smartphone that came and went pretty quick. I'll probably do another video on the Red Hydrogen because I think it deserves its own video all on its own. But that's something that they tried uh, back in 2018, I believe. And I don't think there's going to be a Hydrogen 2 or any other Red smartphone for that matter. So it's interesting to see the evolution of Red from way back in 2005 when it was just this kind of dream and vision and where we are now in 2020 having these incredible offerings in the cinema space and really how much they did change filmmaking. Digital cinema was incredibly expensive and really not all that great before RED and RED has really pushed those boundaries and pushed those limits, pushing for things like 4K RAW, pushing resolution higher and higher and higher for maximum quality while still not losing sight of things like dynamic range and loyalty to their customers and their fan base. I think it's a pretty cool company, even though they like to talk about themselves as being cool all the time by having products named Weapon and Dragon and Epic and Monstro. They do a good job marketing and they definitely have a cool style and a vibe. I've never bought a RED camera. I've shot with RED cameras before. They're great, but they also have their little quirks and their oddities and they're definitely not for everybody. It's not like you're going to get a red and somehow become a cinematographer, award-winning cinematographer overnight. You're going to be the same. The camera's just going to be better. But it's really always up to the individual to use the tool to the best of their ability. And maybe a red is an opportunity to get better at your own skill set. But if you're looking at the Komodo or you're looking at any other red camera, don't think that just by buying it and because it says red on it that it's somehow going to make you amazing. No. Your skills and your talents are what they are, and you might have a, a camera that's a little bit better of a tool, but it's still up to you to make the most of it and upgrade your personal skills. That's going to make far more of an impact on your footage than just having a more expensive or better camera that has the name RED on the side. RED is a cool company, aren't they? They sure are cool, those people over at RED. I do like red. The red one, um, way back then, I was I was a I was a young gun. So in two thousand five, two thousand six, my dad had pre-ordered a red one because uh, he was paying attention to it at the time, just thinking like this is this could be really cool. And uh, never ended up going in on that pre-order just because of the problems with the red one. And it was a little. I think the red one was around seventeen thousand dollars. Um, body only and considering the quirks that it had at the time didn't really make the most sense to spend that much money but did have it pre-ordered at one point in time and then I was really into uh, the Scarlet and wanting that you know to kind of like thinking like oh this would be awesome to have and then I'm kind of glad I didn't get it because that would have been a lot of money for me to spend at the time on a camera that I probably wouldn't got my money's worth out of and as we've talked about before, cameras always just get better. And those same features get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper over the time. So, you know, what a, a Scarlet would have done brand new, get a couple years later for maybe half the price, a third of the price. You know, like the technology moves so quick and the prices come down so fast and there's always something new that I'm kind of glad I didn't, you know, I'm glad I don't have a Scarlet X just sitting around here that like, oh... I don't really use it anymore like I could, but there's just other things that are more convenient, a little bit easier, because um, the RED cameras do have some of those strings attached. It's not always the, the easiest thing to use. So kind of glad I never got one, but definitely it's that vibe of you see someone posting on Instagram and they have a RED. It's cool because they make cool cameras and they market them as cool cameras. So whenever you look at someone shooting on RED, it's like, oh, wow, that's cool. It's like, well, they've done a really good job making products that make you think they're cool, but it is just a camera, and they might be filming something incredibly boring. So don't let, don't get envy from a behind-the-scenes shot of like a RED camera, because you don't know what they're filming. It could be, it could be anything, and it just is an expensive camera filming like toast or something. Let's pop into the chat here real quick. I don't know how much I'm going to have to scroll here. All right. Let's see. Uh, I also like the Black Magic Dine isn't swept up in the sensor size sweepstakes. They do cropped. They like cropped. Yeah, Super 35. Red is my favorite company after Panavision. 
Excellent. Dan the man. And Jayful says, if y'all don't go like the damn video, God Strong's up at 1 a.m. giving us knowledge and y'all being selfish. Yeah, like the video. Sure. Thanks, Jayful. I remember the red one. Red was the black magic design back then. I wonder if black magic will become like red in this decade uh, in the 2020s. Yeah, red one, Red was like the black magic of the time because like the, they're expensive n now and they in comparison to like, you know, a $2,000 camera, yes, red has always been expensive, but compared to the $100,000 digital cinema cameras, like red was incredibly cheap. And so like they undercut the market and then gobbled up a good portion of the market. I think last I checked, red's at about like 25%. Maybe they're a little under that now. They've gone down to like 22% of like the cinema market in terms of how many films are shot on red. And I think it's around like 20 to 25% of, of movies are shot on red. So that's like pretty sizable um, considering it's, um, you know, it's a still a relatively small company uh, based in America. You can email the CEO if you, if you want. Um, you know, he posts on Facebook all the time. Uh, it's Jared now. I should have, maybe I should have mentioned that. Uh, Jim from Oakley, uh, step back. And then Jared land who was with red for a long time. I don't know when he officially started, but it was very early on. Jared is now the, uh, kind of head of red. And so, yeah, it's, it's kind of a cool company, just the, the access and the, their story, their style. It's very fun. And it's some people, it rubs them the wrong way. Some people don't like the red fanboys and it's, you know, kind of back and forth and all oh, red is this and all that, this and that. But in general, I'm just glad we have a company like Red doing what they're doing just for variety in the marketplace. I don't think we need more corporations and stiff suits and more stuff that's just kind of cookie cutter. It's like I like more of the innovation and the, the spunk and the rebellious attitude that you get with Red and maybe some of these other kind of startup-y uh, type companies. I mean, to make a camera company is a big deal. So there's definitely been startups like Digital Bolex, and then there's another one I can't remember off the top of my head. But, the, you know, um, there's a few companies that don't make it. Uh, but if you're in that kind of, like, I think Black Magic's in a good spot because they were so well established in that kind of, like, tech AV space. And then moving into having these cinema cameras along with having, you know, the codec and the, the software suite to, like, handle that full work, workflow is awesome. And the fact that they're making their cameras so affordable for that like consumer level, as well as having the kind of professional, you know, I don't know how many films are properly shot on, you know, Ursa minis. I don't think it's all that many, but definitely having a camera that gives you that like high end production value in a price point that's maybe more, you know, someone who does video production at maybe like a corporate level or a commercial level or something like that. They have access to something. They don't have to spend the... Uh, fifty thousand dollars plus on like a red setup they can get something for maybe around ten thousand that does something very similar so i do like that we have variety out there yeah owning a red is like owning an iphone in 2008 you were a god yeah <laughs> red cameras are best for stylistic work like commercials music videos and sci-fi movies uh area will go the way of panavision in this decade uh, I don't know. I think Aerie is still, I still think Aerie owns the uh, dominant share of uh, Hollywood production anyway. What do you mean? Yeah, I love how their whole marketing scheme is weaponry. They even call their memory cards mags. That's the coolest thing ever. Yeah, the red mag and the mini mag. Yeah, they just, they, they're smart about how they brand their products in a way that is cool and is clever beyond, and I've talked about this before too, but like, who cares what a GH5 even is? Like, we all know what that is, but no regular person, like like A7S3, like, you know, C3PO, R2D2, these things are just like numbers and letters strewn about. And like, if you have something like C3PO and R2D2, like they become characters because they have a face and identity. So like things like the GH5 kind of take that on or like the A7S kind of take that on. But there's plenty of other cameras like the G100 or the G85 or the G9 or the G, you know, 8X or whatever, you know, Lumix names are, you know, the S1, the S1R, the S1H, the S5. Like there's so many variations of these SKUs that Red does the smart thing of like, you know, it's the Helium. And you're like, oh, it's the Helium. Oh, it's the Gemini. Ooh, amazing. Oh, it's the Epic. Like they give them names, which can be hard to track. 
like digging through the kind of history of red to put all that together isn't easy. Even the Wikipedia pages, I tried to do my best to make that as straightforward and, and easy to follow as possible. I'm sure there are probably mistakes in my presentation as well, because like I said, I'm, I'm not living and breathing red every single day. I'm sure some people will argue of like, well, that's the year it was announced, but it wasn't released until the next year. Or you got that backwards. or, But in general, that's more or less the order. Um, or you have other companies that just do, you know, it's the MacBook 2011, it's the MacBook 2012, it's the MacBook 2013. And I think there's some value to that as well. Just knowing like what year something came out kind of puts it in place. If like iPhones were like that, it's the iPhone 2012. Like you'd be like, oh, okay, I know what that is. Rather than like, huh, when did the iPhone 6 come out? You know, and I don't even know if that is the 2012 one. I'm just kind of guessing. But Red at least has style. They put names on their products to make them mean something and symbolize something like Komodo, that it speaks more than the Canon R5. Like R5, okay, so what? What is a 5D Mark IV? Like, what does that even mean? For the people who use the cameras, who fall in love with them, it means something. But from your general consumer, like they don't, they don't care, they don't know. Trevor says, give the video a thumbs up. It helps the video discovery algorithm. Oh, sure. Maybe I should say that at the beginning. Give the video a thumbs up. I just don't like any of that like very youtube -y stuff, but it's probably good. Thank you. I'll, I'll just leave it to the chat. You guys tell everyone to leave thumbs ups or thumbs downs, whatever you want. It doesn't really matter to me. But um, yeah, I just having to, I hate having to say that to make it more of like this, like leave a like, leave a comment, leave a this, make sure to subscribe. It just like everyone says the same thing. So then I just like, you just tune it out after a certain period of time. But I do appreciate it for the people who leave thumbs ups. If it does help the algorithm, that's awesome. JFL says, I mean, area will be like a nostalgic camera company, like how Panavision is today. They're used, but only for nostalgic purposes. Yeah, that could be true. Um, we'll see. I mean, area is definitely not catering to the, you know, consumer level. And I think that's, that's the thing. Almost everybody who shoots film, like, okay, let's use Christopher Nolan. Right, for example, which, you know, director, not necessarily cinematographer, but his films are, and Quentin Tarantino, you know, known as these kind of filmmakers who still shoot film. They don't do digital. They only do film. And I don't know if that's 100% true anymore, but at least they're, they're kind of the last holdouts in my mind of people who like late to adopt digital, at least just because they want it to be, they're film purists where everyone else has been like, yeah, digital, it's awesome. So you got to figure that all those people though grew up shooting eight millimeter, 16 millimeter, you know, they like, they grew up in that film ecosystem and they had cheap film cameras at the beginning and then graduated to more expensive film cameras throughout their career. I imagine something similar will happen moving forward where you have younger people now who for the past maybe 10, 10 years, and then definitely the 10 years coming up, you have people who are shooting their first stuff completely digitally, you know, their college film, their, their personal projects are going to be on these hybrid cameras, these $2,000 cameras, probably someone, you know, filming with a Canon RP, you know, will eventually go on to film something bigger and better. I'm sure one day, right? It's going to happen. And so what ecosystem are they going to get into? Are they going to go to Aerie? Like, I don't think so. I think they would probably stick with Canon. Or if you're a Sony shooter and you've been shooting with, you know, the A7 S2, let's say, are then you looking at like, oh, maybe the Sony FX9 or maybe this FX6 that's now on the horizon. Is that where I'm going to go with? You know, if you're a Lumix shooter, okay, there was the EVA1, which didn't do all that well. Maybe I'll get like an S1H or maybe I'll wait for you know, kind of the, the GH6. Um, and then like, eventually like, what does that lead to? You know, are these people going to go get red cameras? Maybe. Are they going to get airy? Like if you, if you project these people into the future, what will their choices be? Are they going to, are they going to go revert back to film because they never did it and they think it's cool and, and, and nostalgic? I don't know. I think it'll be an interesting variety to, to see for sure. But airy doesn't, you know, cater to that low end to where they can get those kind of young adopters to where they have those nostalgic feelings for the brand, where like you'll definitely have that for Blackmagic with the pocket cinema cameras. There's plenty of people out there who are shooting stuff with those that will go on to do bigger and better things. And what will they choose when they're at that point in their career? It'll be interesting to see. 
considering like what, what brands are even going to be around in 10 years. Like who knows? Maybe, maybe they'll all go away. Maybe it'll all merge into one. I don't know. Panavision are my favorite glass. A complete Raven system also wasn't cheap. The brain was 4.5K, but everything together was still 15K. Yeah, true. JFull, um, it's better when you name your camera instead of just numbering it. Ursa, Alexa, Helium, Gemini all sound so fire. Yeah, I think that's why the Ursa, and it, I mean, Ursa's not even that great of a name. People, people say, like, it's one of those names that people say, oh, the Ursula? Oh, is that that Ursula camera? And you're like, it's the Ursa? So, but yeah, it's definitely better than Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. That just in itself is annoying to even type online, let alone say in person. Give it a cool name. I think uh, Black Magic should stick with kind of like the Constellation thing. I've said Orion, like even if you had like, I don't know, Sagittarius is kind of weird, like Capricorn. I don't know. There's something there. Zodiac isn't, a, isn't the name of a camera that I'm aware of. Someone should use that. I mean, red kind of has Gemini, so maybe they have some patent on all, all the Zodiac names. I don't know. But I think just giving it a name is cool. Like Ford Mustang, it means something. You know, Chevy Corvette, like it means more than like, what does Tesla have, the Model S? Like it's just this kind of, I don't know. So it's it's like it's on a spreadsheet. It's in some corporate brochure somewhere. But you want the thing that has a name, that has an identity to it. I think it's easier to kind of latch on to, to what it means to use that device. Let's see. Uh, Genie Tech makes me think mini mags are not that cool. Um, if somebody told you in the 70s or something that Panavision wouldn't be the go-to camera company, they would have laughed in your face. Yep. Yeah, that's probably true because things do change over time and it's very hard to know exactly, like things will change, that is for sure, but how they'll change, no one ever knows quite for sure because there's always new disruptors in the market. Uh, yeah, and if you don't shoot Kodak or Fuji, you're shooting with uh, Ilford, uh, BW Black and White, I assume. Panavision are still are the go-to company in my opinion. They have their own red sensor camera, but don't forget that. Aries biggest customer is Panavision. Yeah, are they still doing the, is it the DX? Is it the DXL? Is that what that thing's called? How many versions are they on of that? I remember when, oh, is it Panavision and Red teamed up for that? And then, I don't know if there's a, is there a DXL2 or something? Um, I love Panavision, but I'm just saying today, Aerie is the go-to until I think Red or somebody takes over, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know who will take over. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe it'll be Lumix with the GH6. Should we talk about the GH6? The DXL2. Yeah. Thank you, Dan the Man. Yeah, DXL2. So um, I remember looking at the DXL. I mean, it's stuff to look at, but at a certain point, I stopped paying attention because it's, it is out of my price price range. And it makes sense if you have, you know, the millions of dollars for Hollywood and rentals and you're that type of company. But as like someone who like, I like having a camera in my backpack that I just have with me all the time and that I can use for proper production, but I can also use just for like family photos and videos as well. Like I think it's, I like just the, the access to stuff. Um, it kind of pains me when to like just rent something and only have it for, you know, a month and then have to give it away. So I would always want to buy something. And that's why I've looked at things like the Scarlet or even the Komodo. But then you just remember like, wow, I'm spending you know, all this money and there's going to be a new one and it's going to be better. And then I'm going to have to sell this one. And, you know, I kind of almost like the stuff that's like, like the GH5. It's so cheap that by the time you want to sell it, you're like, maybe I'll just keep it. Cause like, I'm not really going to get that much for it anyway. So what's the harm in that? Right. And then you can kind of like push yourself to make the most of it. And no, it's not the perfect camera for every project. Of course, things like the Ursa Mini Pro are better, which is why I have one of those too. But in general, I think it's definitely good for the vast majority of people to use the low end stuff and, and refine your craft and get good at the other things that are far more important. Lighting, set design, wardrobe, actors, if you're doing something like that, or just like the, the creativity of like, what are you capturing? And then making it, setting it up so that it's actually like good looking and beautiful and, and then hit record on the camera. And it doesn't really matter at that point 
if it's a $2,000 camera or a $20,000 camera, if you did your job on all the things in front of the lens, what's happening behind the camera, yes, there's things like dynamic range and the Kodak and like, we all know that that matters, but it's also very easy to get caught up in just that. And then people go out and run and they, they get a Komodo cause they hear it's awesome. And then they're still filming garbage and it doesn't look all that special. I've seen Komodo test footage. That's like, okay, like I could have done that with a GH5 too. Like there's no difference because it's not actually using the camera in a meaningful way that like takes full advantage of the Komodo. It's just like doing basic stuff that you can do with any old camera. Let's see, how much do you think the GH6 is gonna cost and what's the specs? Jayful, we are gonna to get to that. I got a whole other presentation we're gonna talk through. We're gonna talk about the GH6 and what I think it should be. It's gonna be good. Do you think dynamic range will be the more important technical specification moving forward and less so image resolution? No, I think they'll both be equally important. I think it's good that camera um, manufacturers have gotten good at labeling dynamic range and it being a selling point because it is incredibly valuable. But I do think resolution is valuable as well because it does have its certain applications in terms of reframing and post, like we all know, like you can do more with more, more resolution. I think ultimately where stuff will probably move to, at least I hope, maybe this is something we all can work on encouraging, is just like maximizing the efficiency of the workflow. And that's why I gravitate towards things like black magic because like beginning, middle to end, that whole workflow is so nice and well thought out and streamlined that it makes shooting those cameras really easy in terms of the menu and the functions on the cameras. They're great cameras and shooting the footage is excellent, but then editing and processing that footage is just as easy and fun uh, and intuitive, even, even using Resolve. You know, it's, it's a complex program, but it is also relatively straightforward and you can do some really powerful things with it pretty simply. And then to output, you know, just maximizing the efficiency of that workflow rather than a system where, oh, the codec's not quite right, so you have to make proxies, and then, oh, that file format, you need to upgrade your computer, and oh, this, and oh, that, and oh, you gotta get this specialty device to do whatever, and it's like, I would just want it to be simple and streamlined, and I think that is really, really valuable. Making the camera fun and enjoyable to use, making the editing fun and enjoyable process to where you're not pulling your hair out, stressing of like, why does my computer keep crashing? Why can't I play this back? I just want to edit this video. Blackmagic is doing a really smart, like smoothing that process out. Cause I'm a site, I mean, Red definitely has their workflow, but that's, you know, a little bit more complicated and still kind of cumbersome for some people. Blackmagic is doing it really smart. So I do like leaning that direction as opposed to something of like, the camera's great and it can shoot 8K raw, but nothing can open those files. Or it shoots in this weird, you know, 10-bit, strange, goofy codec that, you know, only your iPad can edit. And you're like, well, okay, but we've got great autofocus. It's like, okay, yeah, but like, it's not fun anymore. You're making it a pain that I have to do all these extra steps. Um, so just like, Get it, get it, get all that stuff out of the way and, and focus on the workflow. I think that's probably one of the most important things in addition to dynamic range, resolution, things like autofocus, you know, becoming more and more important. Um, that will be a thing. Stabilization, battery life. There's a lot of stuff that's really important. Uh, Tenet is the Airflex 765, the Panavision Sphero 65 and the System 65 lenses, some scenes IMAX Mark III, Panavision Sphero 65 and Hasselblad lens IMAX Mark IV, Panavision Sphero 65 and on and on and on. <laughs> yeah, thanks John. Yeah, it's, uh, the more I think about Tenet, the more I like it. it. It definitely could have been better and it should have in just the way it communicates but in general, I want to see it again because uh, the more I think about it, and then the soundtrack is out now. When so the film was did like this early release thing, and the soundtrack wasn't available anywhere, um, at least anywhere that I had easy access to, like YouTube or Spotify. But you know, Warner Music has finally put that out. I think it's on Water Tower Records or something on their YouTube channel, and the soundtrack is so awesome. Listening to that watching some more uh, reviews and critiques and, you know, theories about Tenet just makes me just want to see it again. That's a really cool experience. I definitely like it for the unique, the uniqueness of it and it being such a proper film 
rather than something else that feels a little bit more like, I don't know, cheap and cookie cutter, I guess, as far as like Hollywood movies go. I got a two day rental quote for a DXL two full kit and they wanted 24,000 <laughs> Australian dollars to hire two days for a DXL two $24,000. Yeah. Uh, put your money elsewhere <laughs> for sure. If you're buying a first camera for video without being invested in glass for any specific company, what would you get from the new cameras out or coming out? Well, pack your bags right now. That would probably be either the Lumix S5 or the Sony a7S III right now, as far as cameras that I am aware of. Those are the two weighing the most in my mind and two that are, would be very easy to say, yes, this is worth buying. As far as other cameras on the horizon, there will be another Blackmagic pocket camera. I'm almost certain of it. They'd be dumb not to. So there will be another one of those, which is maybe worth waiting for, but maybe not if you really, if it ends up being more of a cinema camera than a photography camera. And aside from that, I'm sure there'll be, you know, maybe there'll be like an S5H. Maybe, maybe uh, you know, Lumix will do something like that. But I can't imagine an S5H, they would change the autofocus. So that's where we get into like something like a GH6, where it's like a proper follow-up to a long-standing series of incredible cameras all the way back to the GH1 all the way through the GH5 and the GH5S, and now with a potential GH6 on the horizon, theoretically in my mind, that's where Panasonic makes moves and does something groundbreaking and kind of game-changing in terms of autofocus. I sure hope. If they don't, I don't know. I don't know what to tell them at that point. They know. They know the issues. It's, it's their game to lose because everyone says time and time again, the Lumix cameras would dominate if they just fixed the freaking autofocus. And supposedly it's better on the S5 if you're shooting 4K60 because it's cropped, because it has more frames, the autofocus does work better in that mode. However, I think that's a, an annoying workaround to have to tell to somebody and the autofocus should just work. It should just work all the time, at least to the same level that Canon and Sony do, where they get things in focus. They, they The cameras know what a face is. The Panasonic cameras seem to like, they didn't like, it knows what a face is, but then like, it doesn't care. Uh, I think it was in Tony Northrup's video, his review of the S5. He just does like a normal like walking towards the camera, and it just like totally loses him. And it's like you couldn't. And maybe maybe it's user error. Maybe Tony did something wrong. I don't know. But it's uh, it's just kind of devastating that they haven't they haven't pushed harder in that area. But right now it'd probably be the S5 or the A7S. Three and at that point, I would say go with the one that you can afford. The S5 is two thousand dollars, and right now, if you pre-order it, you get a free lens. The A7S III is thirty-five hundred dollars. No free lens with that, so no matter what, you're gonna have to get a lens. So that's really I mean, basically like, do you have two thousand dollars or do you have four thousand dollars? Do you want two cameras? Well, then get two S5s. Do you just need one camera? Well, then get an A7S III. Probably something like that. Let's see, Panavision is an amazing camera company and set the standard, but today they just aren't needed, like IBM versus Apple. Yeah. Pack your bags, I'd go with the S5 and that 20 to 60 kit lens deal, best bang for your buck, cinematic image with V-Log. Yeah. I've had my eye on the C200 for 4,000 brand new, but I don't know. It's too many uh, cameras dropping, but I just want to jump into the cinema camera line and move from DSLRs. I use the 5D Mark IV currently. Well, Jayful, I don't have one on hand, but I do have a 5D Mark IV around here, so I definitely uh, can relate, but uh, I don't shoot any video on the 5D Mark IV. If you want to get into the cinema game, I don't know. I can't speak to the C200. If you need autofocus, then Canon... If you need autofocus in a cinema camera, Canon's the way to go. However, I definitely prefer the Blackmagic cameras and the workflow. I think the Canon cameras, I haven't used, personally used the C200, so I can't speak to it. Definitely rent it or try before you buy it and do the full thing. Don't just shoot with it. Edit the process, edit all the way through, start to finish. 
so you know that your computer can handle the files because Canon footage in the past with their MXF format and all this nonsense has just been a total pain and I've hated it. Blackmagic, you shoot a file, it's one file, you drag it in and it edits like butter. And out of all the cinema cameras and all the cinema companies, I personally prefer Blackmagic the most because I think they're, they're the most affordable and then also kind of some of the best featured aside from autofocus. If you need autofocus, you're going to have to look towards Canon. But aside from that, I'd say everything else is in Blackmagic's favor. Who is the DP for Tenet? It was uh, Hoytema Van Hoytema, Hoya, Hoya Van Hoytema. I don't know how you say that name, um, but not Wally Pfister. It's the, um, the same DP who did Interstellar. And then I believe also did Dunkirk, maybe? I think Nolan's been working with, um, I think I think it's Hoyt. Hoyty? Hoyte? Van Hoytema? I don't know. It's It's one of those names. It's like my name. I'm sure there's plenty of people who look at my name and go, what in the world? How do you say that? Hoite van Hoitema. Yeah, there you go, John. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that's how you say it. Black Magic is an interesting spot. I feel like they have something to surprise on their sleeves, like how the 12K Ursa Mini. Hoitema is a beast. Um, it knows what the face is. It just doesn't know the distance. And if contrast is too low, it doesn't even know how sharp it is. <laughs> Sad how he yeah. had. It knows it's a face, but not in focus. Awesome. Thrilling. I think autofocus on the S5 is enough for normal use. It will be better in a future update, but for professional use, we will all use manual focus. It depends. Some people shoot with gimbals and they just can't, they don't have a setup to be pulling focus manually. So like, I, I understand there's plenty of people who shoot that way uh, for certain things, you know, weddings come to mind, um, but also music videos, commercials, that type of stuff. Um, depends, you know, if it's a low budget thing and you don't have uh, the dollars and resources for additional people and wireless uh, video setups and pulling focus and all that stuff. Autofocus can be very attractive for some people who shoot that way. Nolan never going to let him go. Dunkirk and Tenet solidified that. Yeah. Uh, it's the autofocus that got me. Other than that, I'd be gone to Blackmagic Pocket Cinema, camera 6K, yep. And then Damn Interstellar 2. Yeah. Uh, Interstellar was the first one because uh, Wally Pfister, who had done all the DP work on most of Nolan's films before that, went off to direct Transcendence. I believe that's the name of the film. It's the one with Johnny Depp where he dies and then becomes kind of an AI. He gets His mind gets put in a computer. I'm not spoiling anything. It's an all right film. It's nothing amazing. But Wally Pfister, who was the DP for Nolan before, went off to direct that movie um, and so for Interstellar, uh, Nolan switched DPs, uh, which I don't know if that's, I, I don't know what the, the story is from, from there on and what Wally Fister's up to now, but, um, that was kind of like a, a, a separation point in their, in their careers. Cause they had worked together, uh, Nolan and Fister, they'd worked together basically on every film, uh, together before that. Why no one complain on Blackmagic camera autofocus, but on Lumix? Um, that's a good question. Awesome. Thrilling. It's, it's because the Lumix cameras are just so closely aligned with Canon and Sony where the black magic stuff is cinema cameras. It's that arbitrary distinction people make. And maybe I do it, you know, maybe I don't uh, complain about black magic's autofocus uh, and maybe as much as I should, but I have both an Ursa Mini Pro and a GH5. So clearly I don't care about autofocus up until this point. It's just now moving forward looking at what Sony's able to do and then seeing what Canon can do, but also can't do. It's not perfect by any means. So I'm, I'm curious to get my hands on the Sony a7S III to see if that works better. I kind of have a feeling it will, but at least on the R5, it definitely is better uh, than a Lumix. And most of the Lumix cameras are also meant for that kind of vlogger style uh, of shooting, which I do from time to time, um, certainly for my own stuff right? But um, a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera you're not vlogging with because the screen doesn't flip around. And so unless you really want to rig an external screen just for vlogs, that seems kind of silly. So I think autofocus for those people is important for kind of your YouTube creators, people who make that type of content want to be able to just set a camera and talk to it and have it get them in focus really, really quick. 
that is valuable and beneficial and why Lumix would be in like the GH5 and the S5 would be compared more towards Sony and Canon because they all have those flippy screens as hybrid cameras and then Blackmagic maybe strategically smartly even on the Ursa Mini Pro it has a flip screen but it doesn't flip all the way around so you couldn't really you know vlog with an Ursa Mini because the camera the flip, the screen doesn't flip all the way around and that I do think that's annoying because like there's just sometimes where I want to flip the screen all the way around because the camera's up against a wall uh, kind of like this orientation is right here but that that probably is the distinction just that they don't have flip screens so they don't get used for quite the same purposes and so it's less common that people are going to kind of complain about autofocus uh, because Blackmagic Design is a cinema camera and only a few have any autofocus to speak of. Blackmagic goes for the filmmaker approach and Panasonic goes for hybrid shooters. And they forgot to say Lumix with it. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Lumix. So if you didn't see my video, I uh, quickly cobbled together. Uh, I just thought it was funny based on all the S5 reviews and kind of videos talking about Panasonic S5, Panasonic S5, Panasonic S5. It's like, it, meanwhile, it says Lumix on the camera. I'm staring at Lumix and like very few people say it because everyone just says Panasonic. It's in the names of the videos. It's how they, oh, it's a Lumix or it's a Panasonic. I'm trying to be more intentional about calling it a Lumix because that's what it says on the camera. If Panasonic wants me to call it a Panasonic, they put Panasonic on the camera, but I'm going to call it a Lumix because that's what it says on the camera. And I think that makes the most sense to any regular person who you're recommending a camera to, like, oh, the Lumix GH5, yeah, get the Lumix, that's the good one. Or the Lumix S5, get the Lumix S5. You know, if you say get the Panasonic, they're gonna go, I've never seen it, uh, I've, I didn't know Panasonic made cameras like that. I know Panasonic makes microwaves because there's the word Panasonic on it. So it's like they want to put, they put so much Lumix branding on all their products that I don't even think it says Panasonic anywhere on the GH5. Maybe on the underside on that like the serial number strip thing, but everywhere else it says Lumix. Doesn't say Panasonic anywhere. So why would anyone know that it's a Panasonic? And I do find it really funny, all the people on YouTube making reviews saying the Panasonic S5 and then they show a shot of a camera that says Lumix on it. Like... I can do it right now. Like, oh, look at my Panasonic GH5. See how it says Panasonic right up at the top? That's how I know it's a Panasonic. That says Panasonic. It's almost like you're speaking another language, you know, when you have to talk about cameras in this way. It's just, it's kind of silly that we've gone this far and it hasn't been more, more of a thing, more pressing, that people just, it's a Lumix. It says Lumix on it. Call it a Lumix. Let's talk about Lumix, shall we? Let's talk. And really, if you want to know everything there's to know about Red, go over to Red User, because that's where it's at. But let's talk about the Lumix GH6. So, the GH6 is inevitably coming. Surely it must be. Panasonic would be silly not to make a GH6, a Lumix GH6 for that matter. The GH5, the GH4, and the GH5S, all incredibly popular cameras. There has to be a GH6, but people are worried that Lumix and maybe you know the Micro Four Third style and that sensor size is just going away. Micro Four Thirds might not be a thing anymore now that Olympus is maybe kind of getting out of everything. Who's left? Well, there's plenty of companies still supporting Micro Four Thirds, and I don't think it's going to go anywhere, at least not for this generation. I think there's still going to be a GH6. So let's talk about what that could look like. I'm calling this my Lumix GH6 hypospectacle. So it's a hypothetical specifications. The specs, the hypothetical specs, the hypospectacle. I made it up. I Google searched it. There were zero results but I'm gonna coin it, I'm gonna say it's a hypospectacle. Let's talk about the specs that should be in the GH6, even though we know nothing about it, let's pretend we do, and talk about the Lumix GH6. It should be 24 megapixels. This is the same as the S1, as the S1H, as the S5, and the GH5 is 20 megapixels, so 24 megapixels would be a worthy upgrade for GH6 and makes sense given the other cameras in their lineup albeit those are full frame versions, this would be the Micro Four Third version, but 24 megapixels. From there, we can pull 6K60, 10-bit 422, 
just like the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. We can do 4K 120, 10-bit 422, just like the A7S III. And we can do 10-bit uh, 422, 1080p 240. This is the specs that I think a GH6 has to have to be attractive. If it's just 4K 60 or just 4K 120, yeah, the A7S III does that, and it's full frame. You know, it needs the 6K 60. I think that separates it. I think it makes it distinct. People might say, oh, well, that takes away from the full frame line. It's like, yes, but if I'm going to go micro four third, I need there to be additional features for micro four third, right? This needs dual ISO, just like the GH5S, the GH6 needs to have dual ISO, just like the S1H and the S5. Low light capability is incredibly important nowadays, and it's just another reason, especially on a micro four third camera, to go for something like a GH6. When we're looking at a GH6, we have to keep in mind everything else that's out on the market and how it compares, because micro four thirds is looking smaller as a sensor size compared to full frame when the A7S III is doing so much of this stuff in a full frame body. So we have to have things that stand out for micro four thirds that make the GH6 separate and distinct. And I think 6K60 would be one. We need the great five axis IBIS that Lumix is known for. It's great. The stabilization is fantastic. Make it better, but of course, keep that in there. And it needs so it doesn't necessarily have to be phase detect, but phase detect autofocus or something similar that works just as well for proper eye tracking, face tracking, head tracking, body tracking. We need autofocus that can track everything. It's a smaller sensor. We need to track as much as we can and actually get it in focus in video reliably 95% of the time, 100% of the time. The Lumix GH6 needs something better than the DFD contrast system they're currently implementing, even on their new cameras like the S5. It's not enough. It's not good enough. Sony and Canon are winning on this one feature alone, quite frankly, for a lot of people. They need autofocus. They need it to work reli reliably, and the Lumix cameras just aren't doing it. The GH6 is the perfect time to introduce phase detect or something similar. Maybe, maybe there's something better than phase detect. Do that, but at least something like phase detect. We need to keep vlog but i think it's maybe time for like a vlog 2 and don't give it vlog light or anything like that no the gh6 deserves vlog or a, a variation vlog 2 i mean sony and canon have s log and c log 1 2 and 3 panasonic still has vlog which is great and it's fantastic vlog l though i don't want vlog l anymore i want proper vlog and maybe even something a little bit better in uh, vlog 2 needs to keep all I and IPB recording modes. I don't want it to just be all I or only IPB. We need both of these modes for basically every style of shooting. That way you can pick and choose as the shooter, okay, do you want higher quality and easier edits, but bigger file sizes, or are you recording for a long time and you want to kind of trim the file size down and maybe it's a little bit more compressed, but you know, you're willing to deal with it because it's a long recording. Having both of those is really, really important. Keep the dual card slots. This is a great feature on the GH5 that wasn't there on the GH4. Needs to be there on the GH6. I don't think we need to go to triple card slots. I think that's overkill, but it, definitely dual. Shutter angle. Have to keep shutter angle. If shutter angle disappears, I'm going to be furious. The GH6 has to have it. Needs to keep the flip screen. If they do a tilt screen... I mean, they would be dumb to, because no, even the GH1 had a proper flip screen a long time ago. Was that over 10 years ago? Had a proper flip screen. Keep it. It is a staple of the GH series. Do not take it away. Lumix. I'll lose my mind. Audio features. This is one thing I really like about the Lumix cameras, and maybe I take for granted compared to other cameras like Canon. But there's audio features built right into the GH5, like low cut, limiter, meters, like there's a lot of nice audio stuff there. Expand upon that, keep it, but don't lose it. We gotta keep all this stuff. You gotta keep the 8-bit modes too. 10-bit might be too much for some people and they don't necessarily need it. Keep the 8-bit modes as well. Don't just phase them out because you think all oh, those are bad. It's like, no, keep everything we've had before and just add on to it. Keep it the same size. If anything, just the exact same form factor so no one has to buy new accessories, new cages, nothing. Keep it exactly the same. It's a good size. It's a good weight. 
Do you want it bigger? No. Do you want it smaller? No. The GH5 is pretty much perfect as is, and people have a lot of equipment and accessories, so keep it the same size. And have the codecs be easy edit. One of the most annoying things about all these hybrid cameras is they have annoying codecs that are just a pain to edit. They slow your computer down. You need to edit on an iPad in some cases for best performance. People are editing on iPads. This is ridiculous. We need easy edit codecs in the GH6 so that you can just take it right from the camera, right into the computer, and you can edit dailies, no problem. Needs to keep the teleconvert feature. This is a feature that kind of gets uh, underrated maybe on the GH5, but the fact that you can kind of convert some of your prime lenses into somewhat of like zoom lenses, or at least having two different focal lengths per lens is a cool feature that should definitely stay and you have to keep the anamorphic support. It's what the Lumix cameras are now kind of becoming known for. It's this kind of niche quirk they have that, hey, you can shoot anamorphic on a GH5 or even on an S5, you can shoot anamorphic. Keep it on the GH6, make it better if possible, but really just having it I think is enough and a unique selling point for the Lumix cameras. Let's talk about some bonus features. This is where we're maybe reaching a little bit. Everything we talked about before, pretty much has to be there. I don't think anything on that, like it has to be that or better. I don't think there's any way that any of those things is, is removed or lesser than and the GH6 succeeds. It's got to be all those. And by the way, Panasonic, you're welcome. I'm giving you the blueprint for making the perfect camera. You just do all this stuff, you'll sell them like hotcakes. Here's a bonus feature. It doesn't have a mic, it has a micro four third mount but the sensor size is super 35. This is something I've talked about for, I I don't know if I was the first person talking about this, but since the LS300, the JVC LS300, they put a super 35 sensor in a micro four third mount and that camera was awesome because of it. You could use a speed booster and basically get to full frame, you know, full frame look equivalent, more or less close to it because you have a super 35 sensor, but you still have the micro four third mount. And people say, Oh no, but all my lenses, what will we ever do? Those lenses can have a slight crop. Like, you know, you punch in a little bit on the sensor, you gotta get, maybe my sensor specs are a little bit off. You gotta line it up perfectly to where you have enough pixels for Super 35 to where when you crop for micro with a four third, you're not losing too much resolution. I'm sure the people over at Lumix are smart and talented engineers. I'm sure they can figure it out. This would be a really cool bonus feature to say, hey, our micro four third camera also has an oversized super 35 sensor, just like cinema cameras. Isn't that incredible? And then all your adapters, all this stuff just works. You put Lumix lenses on there, those work fine too. It'd be beautiful. Give the GH6 an internal electronic ND. This is just like they have on the FS5 and the FS7 Mark II and the FS5 Mark II. There's an internal electronic ND doesn't have a, you know, a filter scroll, you know, it's small, it's compact, it can fit inside the body. Get an ND in there. We have aperture, we have shutter, we have ISO. We can control our exposure with those three, but there's the fourth, ND. It's the fourth way to control your exposure. Equally as important as all the others. Most of the time you want shallow depth of field. So you're really not playing with your aperture too much. No one is shooting at f16. You're shooting at f, you know, 2.8. You're shooting at f 1.7. You're shooting at f 4. That's where you want to be. You go outside, it, that's too bright, but you're not going to stop down. You don't want to shoot at f 18, f 22. That's ridiculous. Your ISO, we can go down to 200. Maybe you can go down to 100. Maybe you have a camera that can go down to 50. But realistically, like, you need to go darker than that. Your shutter, it's 180 degrees. It's locked. You're not playing with shutter speed to control your exposure. Specifically, when you're doing video you don't have a lot of options regarding those. The only way to control your exposure really for video or for cinema is with an ND filter. So put it in the camera, that way it's there all the time, no matter what situation you're in, you always have it at a moment's notice. Give it HDMI raw. This is, this is a little bit of a wild card, this is a little bit crazy. You're doing it with the S5, you did it with the S1H, Lumix, give the HDMI raw output just because, just because it would be awesome. Why not? It's the GH6. It might be the last micro four thirds camera, at least the last good one anyway. Go all out, give it HDMI raw. We need to be able to magnify during live recording. 
You can punch in, you can double tap on the screen before recording, but once you hit record on the GH5, you can't magnify to check focus during recording. This needs to be fixed. This is something you can do on the Blackmagic cameras and you can't do it on the Lumix cameras yet, but the GH6 needs to, has to have it where you're recording and you can double tap, check your focus. It will be awesome. Give it resolution stacking. More of a photo feature, which is great, just like the G9 and the S5, be able to take those burst modes uh, using the five axis you know, image stabilization and stack your resolution. Make these ultra high megapixel photos, just build it in there. It's basically a software feature at this point. You did it on the G9, you did it on the S5, do it on the GH6. People will say, it's not full frame, it's not full frame, uh, uh. who cares? We've been shooting with the GH5 for a long time, the GH5S, beautiful footage from Micro Four Third. And guess what? The GH6 should be $1,750. Basically $1,800 should be what the GH6 is. And oh, wouldn't you know, that's exactly half of the A7S III for $3,500. And as we've talked about, this would have better features than the A7S III. Half the price, half the sensor size. I think that makes sense. I think that's fair. I think a lot of people would scoop up a GH6 if it was $1,800, basically half of an A7S III. Hey, you can get two GH6s for the price of one A7S III, and it's just as good in low light. It does 6K60, it's got the autofocus, and oh, by the way, it's 24 megapixels, not just the measly 12 that you get on the A7S III. And people will scream their heads off and say, but it's not full frame, it's not full frame, it's not full frame. And meanwhile, we're all sitting there with our awesome Lumix Micro Four Third lenses, that are small, they're lightweight, they're compact, they're beautiful and they work great. And we don't have to invest in new glass. If you're a GH5 shooter, you've already got all that lined up. And you say, GH6, yes. Yes, Lumix, yes, Panasonic, take my money. Here you go, you gave me everything I could ever want. You included all the bonus features and even then some. I'm sure they're, they're cooking up things behind the scenes that are even more magical than I can describe here. But at least this is a rough blueprint for what they should be doing. Because at this point, the S5, the S1H, the full frame, Lumix stuff, it's all right, but they gotta fix that autofocus. They gotta do it. Canon and Sony have it relatively figured out. The GH6 is the perfect opportunity to come full force swinging as hard as they can to really showcase the power of Micro Four Thirds and why it, it has advantages. Micro Four Thirds being smaller, a smaller sensor, you should be able to do faster reads on the sensor. The lenses should be smaller and more lightweight and still just, you know, as fast. You're not going to have as shallow depth of field. I know that. But in general, taking advantage of those benefits, it is mind boggling to me that there aren't longer focal lengths for micro four thirds, considering one of the main advantages of a smaller sensor is that you can, it's, it's cropping in. So it's giving you more of that teleconversion just by the sensor itself. So it's easier to shoot at 600 millimeters, you know, with a, a lightweight 300 millimeter lens, go crazy, go all out, all the full frame, long, super telephoto lenses for wildlife and sports. They're like, they're massive and they're like F 11. They're, they're ridiculous. Make some long, make like a, you know, like 500, 600, make it eight, make a thousand millimeter lens. I don't know. Go crazy. Go all out. Tap into the benefits of micro four thirds. Don't try and do just the wide end stuff. We kind of got that with the Leica uh, 10 to 25 zoom lens. That's great. We all know the Sigma 18 to 35 with the speed booster. That's awesome. You got things like you can put a speed booster on these cameras and make them and give you that wider field of view, but go long. You know, reach, reach for the stars, reach for the moon, go crazy. Get some really long glass out there that's fast. I don't want F11. I don't even want F8, you know, F4, 5.6, long, long lenses. And uh, I think we'll be good with the GH, GH6. I think there's a lot of promise. I think there's a lot of potential for Micro Four Thirds. The GH5 and the 5S, incredibly popular. Lots of people love the cameras. I love them. I love the GH4 before it, all the back to the, to the GH1. I love the GH1. And the GH6 could be that kind of final home run swing for Lumix in Micro Four Thirds because the future probably is full frame, but let's at least get one more, at least one more good one. Make a lot of money. Panasonic, I want you to make a lot of money. 
just deliver on some of these features that should be on your radar. If they're not, they are now. Hopefully you watch this video and you know what we're expecting, at least what I'm expecting. And maybe there's something I'm missing, which would be, you know, listen to other people too. Check the comments, see what other people are saying. It might be probably too late. You know, the GH6 needs to come out sooner rather than later. In fact, you know, get on it, like announce it real quick. I know you just had your announcement. Lumix S5, hey, that's great. People want to know, where's the GH6? So, time's ticking. Get on it. They better move quick on that. <sighs> oh, the GH6. Let's see where we at. Uh, okay. Forgot to say Lumix with it. Uh, good morning. Good morning. It's almost good night for me, but good morning to you. The head of Panasonic Imaging all but saying they're developing a GH6 in a video interview. Yeah, they've said it, but they haven't said the name GH6. They haven't leaked any specs. Weird, I feel like Panasonic doesn't sponsor it by leaving out their name. Meanwhile, Sony, Nikon, Pentax, Olympus, Fuji, and Canon put their names in. Uh, 24 megapixels on micro four-thirds without increasing readout noise, killing low light, video and dynamic range will be an engineering challenge, but solvable perhaps. Well, that's where I would tap into dual ISO, right? Go triple ISO, go quadruple ISO. I don't know what you have to do, but make it good in low light, right? Like, yes, make the pixels bigger. Sure, sure, sure. But I don't know. They, I, there's got to be a way. Figure it out. Figure it out. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a camera engineer. I'm just some guy who comes up with hypothetical spec sheets for what cameras could be or ought to be. And I still don't like how Lumix uh, charge us the vlog upgrade. Yeah, I'm glad they're including it on the S5. Like, that should be the standard, just include vlog. I think they'll never use phase autofocus, but hope with DFD autofocus will be better with smaller sensor, better than 4K 60 APS-C sensor of the Lumix S5. I would not mind if they put 32-bit flow audio in a new camera. Ooh, so you can almost you almost cannot peek into side levels, et cetera, in post. That would be really cool if they put 32-bit audio in. That's something I hadn't considered, but would be very valuable. I think the GH6 will maintain its sensor size and specs, but Panasonic is going to go all in on high frames per second. You'll get outstanding 120, 180, and 240. I hope so. And I think there should be a resolution increase and I think low light has to be better. You have to take the GH5 and the 5S and merge them. I think the fact that those are two separate, I think it's like you want the GH5 that's good in low light, but you want the stabilization too and you want more than 12 megapixels. And that's the problem that people are having with the A7S III. It's the one thing that people say about the A7S III. Oh, it's only 12 megapixels. If you can have some more megapixels, but then, so, and it doesn't have to shoot in the, you know, pitch black. It doesn't need to be night vision, but just like good, clean, dual ISO, however it works, make it happen. They'll also update the color science to match the GH5S. Yeah, I think the footage out of the S1H um, was really nice. So when I rented the S1H, was playing around with that, like the footage is beautiful. It's great. Great dynamic range, great colors. I love it. Stack sensor with global shutter, <laughs> menu setting to lock sensor to zero movement. Then it kills the GH5S and the Komodo handheld. Shaky shots on uh, global shutter looks great and so retro. Um, yeah, I mean, I I doubt they'll do global shutter, but it'd be cool if they did. People must understand how the speed booster almost makes it full frame. Um, I mean, could you expand on that? Maybe there's something I'm missing, but on the LS300... I would put a speed. I put a speed booster on the LS300, and you have a Super 35 sensor, so it's going to expand it. It's not exactly full frame, but it gives you that field of view, um, the wider field of view. Because yeah, the, if the GH5, like the GH5, you can't get close to full frame. Well, people will say that you have to use the if you use the speed booster XL. I think I think you can get to like 1.3 crop. I don't know. There's a bunch of math involved. Um, and I hate doing it for the different speed boosters for the different cameras. But in general, if you have micro four thirds, which in general is a 2x crop, and you can kind of make that look like Super 35 with a speed booster, if you start with Super 35, you can pull that to uh, roughly close to full frame. Live view composite mode two. Speed booster increases field of view, which is nice. I have one, but it's not really the characteristics of a full frame sensor. Well, that's true. It's not exactly the same. 
but it is helpful to have when you are dealing with a small sensor camera. I'm wondering why people want full frame now. I went micro four third because full frame was so heavy and my Vazen 40 is inc insanely heavy. I cannot imagine what a full frame version would weigh. Uh, yeah, that's true. I was referencing the micro four third because I have a Viltrux. Yeah, so micro four third with a speed booster won't get you close to, to full frame. That's why it's a little confusing what JVC did with the LS300. So I did a review on the LS300 uh, years ago now, but it was a micro four third mount but the sensor size itself was Super 35, which is one of the few cameras I'm aware of that has done anything like that. Apparently Super 35 sensor size will fit inside the Micro Four Third mount. Um, I'm sure it's not optimized for it, but it does fit. So in essence, you basically have, and this was important at the LS300 time because there were also weren't a lot of other good mirrorless options out there. You had Sony with the E-mount, and Lumix with the Micro Four Third mount, but like Canon and Nikon and like, it was all still DSLR mirror box type stuff. So the cool benefit of having that Super 35 sensor with the you know Micro Four Third mount is that you could use the speed booster. So a speed booster from a GH4 or a GH5 could fit right on the LS300, but instead of you know expanding Micro Four Thirds to Super 35, you're starting with Super 35, expanding it to a full frame. So, or, Focal reducing, right, is what you're, that's a focal reducer. Um, so uh, I, I doubt they'll do it, but I do think it's one of those kind of cool nifty things that was really just like an oddball quirky thing they did with the JVC LS300 that made that camera, I think, kind of special and unique and intriguing. And I think it's just kind of a cool thing to, to do. It's like, yeah, put the bigger sensor in there. Why not? If that helps you with what we're talking about with low light and resolution and all that stuff, I understand that, you know, micro four thirds is a, a sensor size and it has lenses that are made for that size. You can, you can still crop in and it's fine and nothing is lost as long as the sensor itself has high enough resolution. So if you're talking about, okay, it's a super 35 sensor that's got, I don't know, 24, 26, 28 megapixels worth of resolution, and then you're cropping down on that. So now your micro four thirds has like 20 megapixels or, you know, 18, somewhere in that range. You know, you're not all the way down at 12, so you're still in that kind of GH5 ballpark range, but hey, now you have this added benefit. So if you do want to use any kind of adapter that, you know, is going to work well, you've got the opportunity to use a speed booster and, and theoretically get like a quasi full frame look on something that does have a smaller sensor. So it can do some of the things that are easier to do on that smaller sensor, like high frame rates. So it's kind of like the best of both worlds, sort of, but it is kind of goofy and weird because people have gotten so used to micro four thirds being 2x crop, you know, then there's APS-C or Super 35, and then there's full frame. And then, you know, the speed boosters are kind of those cheats to cross those gaps. But by putting a Super 35 sensor in a micro four third mount, you get across two gaps with one speed booster, more or less. Um, I want to dress for you. So, I think uh, GH6 likely it should be soon. If they're still, if they sit on that for another year, who I think I think they'll lose too much to uh, to Sony. And I'm I know the S5 will be popular with some people, but I can't imagine there's a whole lot like if. If you're if you're investing in a new system and you look at all the Sony glass out there and how much Sony has been doing in terms of eye tracking for autofocus and now the A7S III being fantastic in low light, and the only setback is that it's 12 megapixel photos, which a lot of the people maybe don't really care about anyway because the photos aren't necessarily used in the kind of high megapixel. And I mean, in fact, a lot of times like I don't even necessarily want the 45 megapixels of the R5. Because they're just like a chore to edit. They're just it's more data. It's bigger file. It takes longer to process. You load them into Lightroom and it just takes forever. So it's like I almost sometimes want less megapixels. If I don't if I don't need them, I definitely don't want them. And you can shoot that way on the R5. You can kind of shoot a, a smaller resolution for your photography if you want. But you know, a lot of people if they get the A7S3 and they look at it and they go 12 megapixels, like yeah, well if I need more, I'll bring another camera. But in general, like that's pretty good and uh, or at least good enough for posting to Instagram or basic web photography type stuff. It's certainly not as much as you want for like a professional paid gig probably, but 
if you know those are coming up and then you bring another camera, like that's fine. But just as a camera to have, the a7S III makes so much sense, I think. Granted, I haven't used it personally, but just looking at what it's capable of on paper, it's very, very attractive. So definitely wanna get my hands on it, try it out and see if it actually works as well as it should. And then if it does, I think that's an easy, obvious choice. Whereas something like the S5, I wanna love it and I do love it. It's a great camera for a great price. It's cheaper, it's got better features, but it's missing the autofocus and it doesn't do 4K 120, which n no camera has really done in this price point until the a7S III and the R5 introduced it. But now that it's a thing, it's clearly a thing that's missing from the S5. And not only that, but the 4K 60 mode on the S5 is cropped. So whereas the A7S III is doing full frame, 4K 120, no problem, the S5 has to crop in to do 4K 60, and it has inferior autofocus. So there's a lot there that's just kind of like those couple things really separate it, and even though it's cheaper and has amazing features, I think what it's missing is, is kind of annoying in like a very alarming sort of way of like, ah, if those were just there. Cause I love, I love this, the thought that's put into the Lumix cameras in terms of offering you the features that you would want, like as a filmmaker or as a hybrid shooter, it just, there's a lot of effort that they put into giving you the features you'd want. This will be a little bit more obvious when I do my proper R5 review, cause that's where I, I come from, right? Coming from somebody who shoots with the, shoots with a GH5 and a Nursa Mini Pro, and then shooting with the R5, it's like there's clearly stuff that's missing. And then just when you outline that and you put it on paper and you spell it all out, you're like, wow, the R5 <laughs> is missing a, a lot of stuff. And uh, kind of visually showing that I think will be a lot of fun once I finally do that. Um, I'm gonna keep, I don't wanna roll it out too early. I'm just kind of building it as I go, which is why I'm kind of sharing my thoughts on the fly about the R5 so we can have those conversations. And then even if I say something that's wrong, someone else can say, oh, well, did you try this? Or, you know, test this out, or, oh, that's not quite right. You can program this button to do that. So that way I can at least have a final review that's proper and as accurate as possible while still being fairly representative of like my personal experience shooting with the camera. Because I mentioned this before, but like anyone can read a spec sheet. Anyone can go to any digital online store and look at the specs for any camera. And that's mostly what the reviews get into. But really the most important thing is just like, how does the, what's the usability of the camera? What's it like to actually shoot with it? And I find that far more interesting than, hey, it can do, you know, all these features and here's all the bells and whistles. It's like, yeah, but like, then what's it actually like to use it? And the R5 I find kind of cumbersome. Zooms usually are much larger on the telephoto side, so almost all zooms likely cover Super 35 great on the longer side. I don't think it's popular for the GH5 user. I read a lot of comments from G9 user who are saying they would love to upgrade from it. So you're saying people who have the GH5 not really excited about the S5, but the people who have the G9 are? I, I assume that's what that, that means. If Panasonic could intelligently crop on their own lenses to optimize for a larger sensor, a Super 35 would make more sense than the LS300 manual crop. So it just works in auto modes on all Panasonic. Absolutely. And that's what I'm talking about. If it it knows the lens, right? You get that, that data into the camera. It, it communicates with the lens, so it knows what it is. If it sees, hey, this is a micro four third lens, crop in. Oh, this is a Sigma 18 to 35 you know, open up, you know, oh, uh, this is a, you know, Canon 70 to 200 full frame lens with a speed booster. Yeah, no crop, right? Oh, this is the Lumix, you know, 20 millimeter pancake crop in. So as you change the lenses, the camera should be doing it natively, you know, without you having to go into the menus and fiddle with stuff. Les Ordinal says, I wish they'd drop the price of the S1 again and even further. I loved it, but knew the size with lenses was going to be an issue for me. Yeah, no, nah, I haven't shot with the S1, but I've shot with the S1H, and that is even bigger and bulkier and heavier, but it is the first thing I noticed. And I said, I said, wow, this is a big camera. This is a heavy camera for a hybrid camera. I wish this were a little smaller, like my GH5. And what do you know? Lumix went ahead and did it with the S5. They made it smaller which is exactly what it needed to be. That feedback they took into consideration. Now, they may have 
cut some corners or done some things like doing the micro HDMI that like, yes, makes it smaller, but then people get upset that it's not full size HDMI. So it's like, oddly enough, the S5 people say is smaller than the GH5. And they're like, oh, like that's incredible. You can get a full frame camera that's smaller than the GH5. But there's a lot of full frame cameras that have been small for quite a while. I mean, the first A7S was really tiny. I think the Sigma FP is also relatively small. Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, it, it just needs to basically the, the size of the sensor and then some electronic components around it, like it doesn't have to be a big camera, but there's something about the GH5. And I don't know if it's like, because they moved to HDMI, the full size HDMI, they had to make it a little bit bigger, but it's like, it just feels like that right size. And now the, the S5 being a little bit smaller and having micro HDMI they might have been better having put in full size HDMI and just making it the exact same size as the GH5 if they could do it. I don't know exactly how it's designed, but there's something about that size. The GH5 and the R5 feel pretty similar uh, to me. And I think the A7S III is around. It might be a little bit smaller. I'm not sure, but we're zeroing in on this perfect size camera that just feels the way you would want. And not too big, not too bulky, not too small and like a toy. Goldilocks, that's just right. So I'll wrap it up there. It's getting late. Thank you for hanging out. Good night, good morning, wherever you're at, and I'll see you next time.